Hey, all your survey scientists and red researchers, welcome to my tech talk with technical information scientists of the Jackson Laboratory. My name is Dr. Xing Tong, and I'm coming to you from my home office on the east coast of the United States. And I am Dr. Janine coming to you from sunny California and my home. Yep, our job as technical information scientists or TIS, TIS we see in our business is to serve the research community by answering all the most related questions by supporting you with all the potential studies or services run by JAX. And you might recognize us from our formal webinar on Thursdays, or you may have called us at like very late evening on the Friday evening evenings. My Tech Talk is a weekly 15 minute podcast style webinar where we answer frequently asked questions about mouse research. We really wanted to develop this show as a way to build community against uh, with our fellow scientists that might be sheltering at home or might be getting ready to go back into the lab. Um, this is a format where we wanted just to talk to you in a casual way and uh, see what kind of questions you guys have. Yes, yeah, so hopefully you have got your coffee ready. And because it's time for my stack talk, we only have 15 minutes, just enough time for you to finish your coffee. So today we are talking about the control selections controls. Um, we have planned the poll questions for you throughout our show and we would love if you could participate. And right now I am opening our first fun poll questions. You can first select the answers and then um, First, select appropriate answers and then click submit after selecting your answers. Um, this step is critical because otherwise we will not get your answers. So for our first question, we want to know um, what would be the strangest thing you did while attending an online meeting. So just select all the options that will fit for your situations. I put my poll answer in. Did you put yours in, Ching Tong? I did. <laughs> Yeah, I think we have uh, we have collect enough answers. Let me show all the results. All right. Oh, all right. A few of you have cooked or ate a meal. Some of you have been wearing PJs. One of you watched Netflix, and <laughs> just like all of you, I I actually exercise too. I did some squats the other day. <laughs> it's like I've got this headset. I might as well. <laughs> Okay, great. That was fun. Um, I'm glad to know that you guys know how to use our poll question. So now we have a real poll question. Um, and Dr. Xing Tong is going to pull out our other poll question, which is on today's topic, which is controls. So I'm going to share my screen with you if I can remember how to do that. And you'll see um, the, sorry, I'm going to share my application with you. Firefox, there it is. So, uh, Dr. Xing Tang, did you pull up that poll question? I can't see yes, it. Yes, I already pulled this poll okay, question. Great. So, All we right. want to know what is the best strain to control for the genetic background of this mutant strain? The stock number is 007075. It's an acting um, HFP. And go ahead and put that in there when you get a chance. Yep, we'll wait for a few seconds more until the answers have been coming through. Okay. So let's see, it's a CBYJ.B6-TG uh, CAG EGFP1 OSB slash J. Um, okay. It I should be I've, one that I you can get by the name. All right, here we go. Okay. All right, so what is the best control? So we have a few uh, people who said C57 Black 6J, one person who said a hybrid of BALB CBYJ and Black 6J, and a few people who have answered non carrier litter mate. So uh, E is always a, a great um, option, non carrier litter mate um, control. And this is a control that I'm, I'm mentioning based on the genetic background of the strain, which you can tell from the nomenclature. So it looks like we have a few people who got at least the non carrier litter mate control, but another Another option would be option A, which nobody chose, which is BALB CBYJ. So this is a great time to talk about how do you determine what is a good control. So um, one thing you want to do is look at the genetic background of the strain, and you can learn a lot of things from the nomenclature, but you can also uh, look at different parts of the data sheet. So I'm showing you the data sheet, and I'm going to go to the development section as well as the control suggestions uh, section. So I'm going to go in there, and I recommend you guys look at these whenever you're looking at a particular mouse strain. 
So the part that um, tells you about what the mouse strain is is in this detailed description field. Um, but if you go a little bit further down to the development, you actually can learn about what the molecular biology is about the strain, about the EcoR1 sites, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what it says then later is this entire insert, which is this transgene CAG EGFP, was generated in a black 6 j mouse or black 6 mouse, and the mice were then back crossed to BALB CBYJ, which is strain 001026, using a speed congenic protocol. So that's one place where you can look about the genetic background. The other place that you can look is the control suggestions, and this is something that um, people who created the data sheet made an interpretation based on the development and the genetic background to summarize um, other, uh, another way to find your control. So a non-carrier, which many of you answered was the non-carrier litter mate, um, or the BALB CBYJ. And you can also see um, what those non-carriers are if you go down to the breeding section, you can see that if you cry recovered this strain, you'd either get a hemizygous transgenic mouse or a non-carrier for the transgene as a possible control or for breeding. Yeah, so actually from the nomenclature, you should be aware this strain is on the congenic Bob C, BYJ, BY, uh, Bob C genetic background. So it does remind us the, the important, uh, importance of the nomenclature of a mouse strain. So Dr. Cheney, you just mentioned, showed us two places on the strain data sheet that we can find information about the genetic background of this strain. Another way to do this is definitely understand the basics of the mouse nomenclature. So yeah. would you able just to show our audience that how we can decode the name of a strain? Yep. So we're going to go to um, a place on our website. So I'll start here from our main website from the Jackson Laboratory. Hopefully you guys can see that. And if you go into the upper right hand corner where it says search the site in Jack's Mice, you can just start typing in the word nomenclature. Um, and then you'll get these little drop downs. I like going here, nomenclature for mouse strains. And then you'd scroll down here to click here to download the mouse nomenclature quick guide PDF. And we're going to send you guys these links in the thank you email. Um, I have that open here. And I just wanted to briefly mention, so the nomenclature, and we have an entire webinar on this, but this quick guide can get you like 95% of the way if you know a few tricks. So the first thing, um, a lot of you kind of got caught up on the C57 Black 6 as a potential control. And what you want to know is that the order in which these two um, uh, mouse strains are listed tells you what the genetic background is. So you'll notice um, in our example, we had a trans gene and it was, had all this nomenclature here. And then we had a black six that was written here. Um, and then in front of this period, there was a CBY uh, J. So CBYJ and B6 are two nicknames and uh, um, approved abbreviations for the full nomenclature. So here's an example of B6 being an approved nickname for C57 BL6 or C57 BL6J. And then the same thing for this example, 129F. So CBYJ is an approved nickname for BALB CBYJ. And that is the recipient strain that comes first. Um, and then after this either semicolon or period, you get the initial donor strain, which in this case, or in our previous case, was a uh, black six strain. Um, so if we go back to the nomenclature here, or we go back to the development section here, you can see that um, the strain was originally generated on a black six genetic background, and then we're then back across to BALB CBYJ. So you can see that represented here, where this is the original strain, B6, and then there's a period, and then before that comes the um, CBYJ, which is the current genetic background that it's on. The other thing you'll notice here is there's a difference between the semicolon and the period, and the period basically means that it's been back crossed at least five times, or if it's a speed congenic approach, it would be higher than like 96 point or 96.9% yeah, congenic to that um, background. Yeah, one thing I do want to mention here is that you do notice from this example, we have the B6 period CG indicating it is on the congenic B6 genetic background, but it is not specified whether it is on the B6J or B6N genetic background. Please do aware for the substance of an inbred strain, such as C57 black 6J or C57 black 6N, they do have many differences. 
from genetically. And if you have chosen a wrong genetic background as your control, you may get a totally opposite result of your experiment. So please do um, be aware and check off, check all the information from our, our strain data sheet to make sure what will be the exact genetic background of the strain and selecting the model as your control. Right. Um, Dr. Xing Tong is making a good point about the uh, substrain information. So this particular strain does have the CBYJ substrain information. Um, same thing um, here, this actually doesn't have any substrain information, which doesn't matter now so much because it's been back crossed to BALB CBYJ. But um, C57BL6, you can actually look up different substrains of this on a different database called MGI, and I think there's like 100 different substrains of C57 Black 6. Um, so you have to be really careful about it uh, because there are some differences that are specifically known between C57 Black 6J and C57 Black 6NJ or N um, as an example. And the same can be said about BALB CBYJ and BALB CJ, um, as well as many other substrains that exist in um, inbred mouse nomenclature. All right. Um, Xing Tong, Dr. Xing Tong, I think we you know we're talking about the genetic background of a single mutation here, in this case, a, a single transgene. But what about what happens when you start to make more complex modifications um, and you start breeding, say, this strain to another strain? Um, how do you select the appropriate genetic background for those cases? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, in a lot of situations when you establish your cohort, you may have to cross two or even more strains together. Um, such as the query log systems. In that case, you should also be aware what will be the genetic background of your pro uh, progeny, and also you should be think of the breeding schemes from this scheme, whether you can get a legitimate control from the um, from the colony, or if you not, you may want to think of the think of the control selections ahead of setting up the breeding. So I would like to use my own personal examples when I pursue my PhD. Um, we did some time try to track the fate or behavior of the uh, intestine, intestine stem cells. So in that situation, I did cross the LGR5 ERT2 strain with a GFP flux flux allele. So since the LGR5 Cre is actually on the black 6 j genetic background, but the GFP flux flux allele is actually on the mixed P6 and 129 genetic background. Um, the stock number is 004077. Thank you for pulling out the strain data sheet. So in these situations, what I can choose to use would be the non-carriers from the colony as a control. And alternatively, um, since the progeny, I know they would be on a mixed genetic background of B6 and 129. A possible controls would be the B6, 129, F2 hybrid. Um, though, I mean, the first option should still be the legitimate control because it will be more like resemble what is the genetic compositions. Um, another example I do want to share with you is the KPC MOST model. It's the stock number 032429, um, which is a model that, that, I mean, is a very popular model used to study the pancreatic um, ductal adenocarcinoma development. For this model, even though the Keras and the P53 was on, is on the B6 genetic background, but the PDX1 CRE is on the mix of the CB1 and C57 Black 6J. So when we cross this string together to generate the KPC model, you will notice from the nomenclature we're using the stock SDOCK, which is indicating it is the mixed genetic background. So you may not able to choose using the B6 or other inbred strains as a control. The most appropriate control would be the mice from the colony, either heterozygous for the target mutation or non-carriers for the PDX1 create transgene. Great, thank you. Um, I think there's a few questions that are kind of related to what you just talked about, maybe for this KPC model similar. Um, one person asked, what is the control if the mouse of interest is derived from a mating of a transgene on a hybrid background and a targeted mutation done in 129ES cells? So maybe you can, do you want to try and tackle that one? So in this situation, what we see here is that for the transgene allele, it's on a hybrid genetic background but it's not specified whether it's on the 129B6 or what other in breast strains. And the targeting mutation, I assume um, it should be the 129 genetic background because this one was generated on, in the 129 embryonic stem cells. Um, so if we do not know about the hybrid genetic background, I would say the most appropriate control would be, would be the legitimate control from your colony. Um, since you should be aware that a lot of times for the transgene, it is not essential to ge generate the homozygous 
for you to have the chest gene expression. And if it is hemizygous and for the targeted gene, um, if it's homozygous, even though you are using the hemizygous cross with homozygous, it is still possible you will generate a legitimate control. Let's say maybe non carriers for the trans gene, but homozygous for your target mutation. And this mice would be serviced as appropriate control for your experiments. Yeah, I think that's a, 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 since we don't know the exact strains on here, we're kind of making some guesses. Um, but our colleague uh, Pete uh, in our team wrote a webinar that's all about um, breeding schemes. So it's designing and optimizing breeding schemes where we talk about building the controls into the same breeding plan as uh, breeding and creating your experimental mice so that you get both of them at the same time. So it's an efficiency thing as well as allows you to properly control the genetic background. So probably for that person who's asking that question, they might find that webinar to be very helpful. Um, and if you can't find it, let us know and email us at micetech at jacks.org. Um, there's maybe time for one more question. Um, do you want to do the second one? Yeah? yeah. Yes. If I, if, I mean, if we buy the hemisphere transgene mice, we want to breed them. First, the first question is which mice should should be used, and uh, if I mean consumers, they do not have the non-carrier litmate. Sure. So I can. There's maybe a few of them. If uh, if that person wants to put in the six-digit stock number of the specific mouse they're talking about, we can look it up right now. But I'm going to make some assumptions. Um, for some of them, when we breed the strain hemizygous by non-carrier, we usually do also have the non-carrier mice available, right? So if we're making them, we're obviously going to uh, have them available, so you can get both of them at the same time. And I would definitely recommend asking for both. So you would indicate the genotype of the mice that you want. So you definitely want the transgenic mice because that's the gene of interest. But you might also want to say, please also include the litter mate controls or something to that effect where um, you indicate okay. that you also want the, um, the non-carrier controls. Um, and that's really important if it's a strain where the genetic background is maybe mixed or maybe not uh, not congenic. Um, if it is a strain that is congenic, um, you can look under certain parts of our data sheet where it will say our breeding scheme, and sometimes it will actually say the specific stock number of what that non-carrier control is. So sometimes we, uh, I, I know APC min is that way, right, Xing Tong? So APC uh -huh. min is the mutant strain, but we always breed that one to a C57 black 6J, which would be you can either order the stock number or you can order it from the colony. Again, just be aware of the genetic background. I think the last question, we can also simply touch on that. So what do you do if there's a four or more genes modified? I can think of the most um, easiest example would be the 013062, the NSGSGM3 mice. Again, just be aware of the genetic background. For the NSGSGM3, it has even more than four mutant alleles. That should, uh, should be four, three or four, I mean, genes modified. And again, because all of the mutant um, alleles is on the not genetic background, so the best control for that case is still we are using the not um, inbred mice. So, Shing Tang, this is what you were talking about, SGM3 mice, is that right? Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, but it only has three modified. I mean, <laughs> the skin mutation, L2 receptor gamma chain, and the trans chain has been inserted. So, but again, in this case, you, you will see when we cross them together because it is on the not genetic background. So for this strain, it's, I mean, it's not genetic background. And uh, what the control you can choose is still the not inbred mice. Sure. Um, I think uh, this might be a more complex one because it's an NSG strain. It depends on what you're controlling for. And I think that brings up an important um, consideration is we were just talking about genetic background, but there might be experimental controls that you need as well, right? So you might be doing something treated versus non-treated, and it's all in the same mouse. Um, for uh, this particular NSG SGM3 mouse, this is a nod skid gamma mutation, which is a highly immunodeficient strain, and then it has a separate transgene. So I kind of think about this like the NSG, the nod skid gamma part of it, as also kind of being something that can be oh, controlled for as well. Right, right, um, so yeah. it depends, right? So it depends if you're like if you're trying to figure out the control for just this transgene, what's the function of this transgene? For, this transgene versus no transgene, an NSG strain would be fine as a control. But if you really just want to control for the genetic background, you have to look at the individual strains. So I, it's a question of what you're controlling for. And that question, again, since I don't know what those four mutations are, it might be a question of litter mate control. Um, yeah. if, 
and it might be, it may not have to do anything specifically just with a genetic control or genetic background control. You might be controlling for like one of those alleles as well. Um, so I, I, I think it's uh, a much broader conversation. Uh, yeah, that, that will be depending on the work. nature of your experiment. I mean, for more um, brief thing. So I think we don't have time for the rest of the questions. For all of you who ask the questions, feel free to send it to mystech at jeps.org. I think that's all we have for this week. Come in again to my stack talk next week. We will talk about a checklist for well-written manuscripts. And this is Dr. Shintao saying we miss you and we are looking forward to seeing you next week. Stay healthy, stay safe, and stay excited about your research. All right, bye guys. Bye-bye.